Welcome to Fun and Games Side Quests. Every episode is a different host sharing a video game they love and why they love it. If you're interested in a time traveling love story with Pokemon, well, I think you should stick around. Hello, I'm Michael. I'm your host for this episode. I'm a video game collector, podcaster, and writer. So I got my hands full, but if you want to find out more over on Twitter or Instagram, I'm at Matter of Michael. You'll be able to find links to my book, to the podcast that I co host with my older brother called Bits of Time. But that's enough about me. We're supposed to be talking about Final Fantasy, and so let's let's do that. Final Fantasy 13-2 might be unequivocally one of the most overlooked Final Fantasy games. The reason I say that is because it is completely different than Final Fantasy 13, and well, basically any Final Fantasy before it, and I honestly, that's probably what I love about it, and why I'm here talking to you today. I'll be upfront, I'm not the biggest fan of Final Fantasy 13, and when I read my first review on it, it seemed like it was so much different, and I read just one, it probably was IGN back in the day, and I went out and picked it up on launch day, even though I was left with the sour taste in my mouth from Final Fantasy 13, so I never expected to be actually playing this game on launch. It's a wild adventure full of exploring and uncovering pieces of an interweaving story that throws some jargon at you, not as bad as its predecessor, let me tell you, but with a smaller cast for them to focus on, I think that was really one of the strengths of this game, and I think it excelled what it was meant to do, which was to be something different. So they end up creating this fascinating time jumping goodness with a remarkable soundtrack to keep me going for quite a few hours so if that little beginning got you intrigued this is the quick hits on why you might like this game you get to chuck around a mog to find secrets that's very random and it feels kind of funny every single time you do it noel one of your main characters his dress style and some of the drama in this game all around kind of reminds me of Kingdom Hearts. So there's that little plug for you. There is amazing inner dialogue narration between both the sisters, Lightning and Sarah, that are stuck between different times. And you get this narration when you jump into a new time zone and basically when you're leaving it for the most part. There's obviously some changes in between, but I like these narration styles and it makes it feel pretty Heavy is probably the right word I'm looking for. There is customization galore between your characters and your Pokemon-like monsters that you'll be catching. And there's, like I said, that enjoyable soundtrack, there's some amazing, awesome pop and rock songs track on this OST. And we can't go too far without talking about the Pokemon likeness. There is monster collecting, and it's more in-depth than you would think. Especially for this type of game. Not a lot of JRPGs outside of actual pocket monster collecting games really go that deep and this one uh, goes a little bit deeper than you think lightning has a killer design choice just look up the guide to see her in all her glory she's on the front cover obviously actually everyone is basically dressing their best in this game so it's kind of a knockout in design choices especially my boy Caius. his love of purple just yeah check out these character designs they're they're they're, they're good so there's a surface level kind of likes from me and why I think you should check this out. Obviously, you have the tag in the beginning too. This is a love story time traveling Pokemon game and I'm going to go a little bit deeper into why I found so much fun and love in this game. So let's 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 unveil this. Now this might seem strange for being one of the main reasons that I'd recommend this game and say it's worth your time. You're jumping from time period to time period collecting these artifacts and various fragments throughout. This really hits home, and this is going to be a weird comparison, to the collectathon nature that I love in 3D platformers. Does it feel a little strange comparing it that way? Maybe a little, but it honestly, it, it works. It gave me those same feelings when you look at this overall map, which is called the Historia Crux, and think of a, think of a bubble map with connecting points that you can jump from one node to the next, and you kind of have an idea of what it probably looks like. And when you hover over each little bubble, it shows the date that you're entering, plus a little bit of text below that says zero out of three fragments. Giving you that sense that you want to scour this entire level that you've been dropped into and see all that it has to offer. I love that slowly ticking progression, and it really makes me feel like I'm playing a platformer, even though I'm playing a JRPG Pokemon type game. And kind of tying into this whole bubble map, what I love is you get some freedom of choice. 
You can try and find all the fragments, or you can move on onto other nodes. Of course, there is the critical path that you want to follow if you want to get to the main story, but I can get off of it when I want to. And everybody says that about Final Fantasy XIII. It's very linear up until you get to a certain chapter. What I like is they totally broke apart that concept and really went with something different. And exploring these hub worlds, it's actually pretty satisfying. It feels like a live-in world, which I, the predecessor also had troubles with that. Even with all the jumping around from one timeline to the next, I still have this feel of a world being shown to me and a history and all that. And I love that we get to tamper with that, which we'll get to here in a sec. Seeing the, if, and I like that these worlds have a different feel. Some are more open. Some are kind of linear like before, but they all feel slightly big enough that I'm excited to search and scour and throw my mog around and try and find some, you know, out of place time fragments. Seeing the effects you have on the timeline is always fun to uncover and witness as well. And that was one of the major points to me for wanting to keep going on and on and on. Now another fun aspect for me is let's talk the Pokemon. The, the sort of Pokemon. There are only two playable characters, which seems very strange in a JRPG. You have Sarah and Noel, which I'll talk about in a bit. And then you get to recruit enemies to fight on your side. After defeating one of these monsters, you have a random chance, some higher or lower than others, depending on whether the monster is rare or not, to get their crystal, and then you use them in battle. Each creature is set to their own class. Rolls is what they call them in this game, I believe. And I believe there's about six of them. And collecting your team and creating good synergy between them is key to being effective in this game in battle. Now, Sarah and Noel can swap between these classes, these roles, very easily just by one click of the button, which is a lot of what I liked about Final Fantasy XIII. I think their battle system is it's fast, it's fluid, and it's very exciting. And now I get to input my own monsters into it and kind of make them upgrade in a certain way. You, you got me hooked there. And the nice part is these monsters, yes, they can level up by, by being given items. And then they also have these things called Feral Links, which is akin to limit breaks from past games. And there's these skills that are learned from upgrading your monsters that can be infused into the next monster with this monster infusion menu. This can get very, very addicting with a balance of wanting to see what the new monster's innate skills are going to be, but also like which skills should I keep because I really like using that in battle. Maybe this is a good debuff on this role. So you can kind of see the the start of that itch. I'm like, okay, I'm building my team. I'm getting new monsters. And there is actually a mission in this game where you have to battle every single monster. And, you know, the first time I looked at that, I was like, oh, I ain't doing that because I knew that's going to be tedious. But for some reason, it was really hitting the itch with collecting the fragments. I was like, all right, I can have a list of the monsters I killed. This game doesn't do a very good job of having a good bestiary, though. So I ended up looking online And I wrote down every single monster name and I just went through and I checked them off as I killed them. And there was something innately fascinating about that. That was a great feeling I had. Now, is everybody going to go and do that? No, but just just knowing that it is possible, it can be super satisfying when you're going down that process. But that might be just me. And sometimes I get those strange urges. Now, speaking of upgrading your monsters, let's go back to your two main characters. You have this thing called the Crystarium. And an upgrade system for individual classes. And this is pretty cool. It's got this awesome menu looking where the it's in the shape of the weapon that you're holding. And think of the sphere grid from Final Fantasy X and you kind of got what's going on. This is how you gain abilities, new classes, and just beef up your characters in general. And it, it's satisfying, I would say, overall. Now, we've gotten this far, and I've yet to say anything bad. I, mean, I should get to the bad. Some of, I mean, I kind of mentioned this briefly. Some of the drama can be over the top in that Kingdom Hearts kind of way. That can be hit or miss depending on what kind of story you're looking for. And of course, this is a sequel to a 50-hour plus JRPG. So it's smack dab in the middle. And I, I think it does an all right job for newbies jumping in right away, especially with those wonderful inner dialogue narration I was talking about earlier. But, you know, it's less of a con because thankfully today with the wonderful world of YouTube and podcasts, you can catch up pretty easily. But that's almost basically where my critiques stop. There is some live action QTE stuff, which hopefully can be turned off or on. I can't remember, to be honest. Those are always kind of a buzzkill, but the battles that you happen in them are pretty freaking awesome. So I'll take the good with the bad on that one. And that's really all complaint wise 
that I have in this game, and that's freaking wild to me, and probably why it's a very, very overlooked Final Fantasy game. And it doesn't feel like a Final Fantasy game in a good way. You've got memorable characters, crazy set pieces for battles, an intriguing villain, paradox ending separate from the true, true ending, and those range from wacky to heartfelt to a bit depressing, to be honest. An experiment of all-around gameplay that, well, all of it hooked me with the fun. This game feels like an experiment and an experiment that was made specifically for my taste right in that moment. And I was hooked with the fun and the drive to uncover what the motive of our antagonist was and seeing the changes of messing with the timelines. There's a lot to love there. Another point that I really like about this is meeting past characters from your first adventure and seeing how they've changed. You know, now you're actually older than some of those characters. The constant changes of the timeline to revert back to the original one that Sarah remembers is chaotic and fun because it changes the interactions of the characters that they've already had. So if you go to one timeline, you've already experienced this person's memories, but now you're going to go change them and this person's going to be different now. And it's, oh man, go play this game. Because one of its other aspects that I love, it can be finished in under 30 hours. For a JRPG, that is pretty swell. Now, if you want to see more endings, get that platinum trophy or 100% of those achievements, you're looking for a lot more time to sink in, which is wonderful if that's what you're itching. And yes, I do have that platinum, and it was actually a fun grind to get. I think this game is worth your time, but this is where I'm going to sort of stop the episode. Happy gaming to all of you listening, but if you don't want story spoilers, you got to get out of here. And trust me, if you're actually going to play this game... You do not want to hear the story spoilers. It's what kept me going and it got me excited to play this game. All right, that was your last warning. I'm going to go quick so we don't run out of time and I want to hit the highlight notes. Sarah is looking for her sister, Lightning, because she disappeared at the end of Final Fantasy 13, and she's the only one in this timeline that remembers that. Everybody else thinks she disappeared or turned into a crystal. Noel comes into this timeline telling Sarah he was ordered by Lightning to come find her and bring her to Valhalla. So you jump from gate to gate fixing paradoxes to find your way to the end of the world. That's what Valhalla is. Let's talk who Lightning is fighting in Valhalla, and it's Caius. Caius is trying to preserve the timeline because if there are changes made to the timeline, then the Cirrus, Yule, has to witness the changes. Every time a Cirrus sees a change in the timeline, it takes a piece of her life force. Too many time, and yep, uh, these Cirruses are going to die. He's seen her die over and over again and wants to break the cycle. Yule, her specific, this series specifically, is trapped in this persistent state. And since Caius is immortal, by a god giving him their heart, the heart of chaos, he's doomed to an eternity of heartbreak. His end goal is to cause a great enough influx of souls in an event so that a gate to Valhalla will open. So then he can slay the goddess so Yule doesn't have to keep being reborn to die over and over. I mean, I can kind of sympathize with his reasoning, but, you know, in turn, it will destroy time itself to save her. So those are some high stakes there, bub. And his plan is drop the other planet on this one and kill a bunch of people. And let me tell you, the end of this game is one of the best endings I've experienced. It's dark. It's bleak. It's unexpected. Seriously, stop listening if you don't want to be spoiled. So there's a lot that leads up to this, but Caius at the very end tries to get a rise out of Noel because they're kind of in this back and forth battle between each other because Noel's supposed to be the successor to Caius. He's supposed to protect the Cirrus. So Caius is basically goading Noel and Sarah, telling them that he killed Lightning, trying to get them mad enough to finally slay him because Caius just wants to die at the end of time in Valhalla. He'll lift the curse and his centuries of planning to get the timeline to lead to this exact moment. Well, this is what he wants. He ends up forcing Noel to kill him. And when you go back to your original time, Sarah sees the shifting world timeline. Yes, she is also a Cirrus, and her life has been slowly whittling away. And she sees this final one, this final timeline that Caius has made, and she dies in Noel's arms. Valhalla comes into this world, and you realize that Caius won. The end of the world is here. And then the last shot is lightning frozen on the throne of Valhalla. He really did beat her it wasn't a ruse and this is how this game ends just it's bonk yeah done just wow i can't even i can't even talk it's great it's one of the endings that was so unexpected the bad guy wins and i was left with just so many emotions i was like all right this was fantastic i even showed my brothers the lead up explained everything made them come over and watch it 
on my couch side by side. It's that good. Now there is some DLC where you get this alternate secret ending that I haven't played and I won't spoil for you here after I write up on what it is. So there you have it. That's the fun I found in Final Fantasy 13 2. A wondrous, overlooked Final Fantasy game, a hidden gem in the vast JRPG catalog. If you're still here and you haven't played this game, I think you'll enjoy it even knowing where the story goes, because I really did rush to the point to make sure this fits. Thank you to Fun and Games Podcast for giving me this opportunity to share this lovely game to all of you. And with that, happy gaming. Hey there, Screen Beans. Have you heard about Screen Snark? Rachel, this is an ad break. They aren't Screen Beans until they listen to the show. Fine. Potential Screen Beans. You like movies and TV shows, right? I mean, who doesn't? Screen Snark is a casual conversation about the movies and television shows that are shaping us as we live our everyday lives. That's right, Matt. We have a chat with at least one incredible guest every episode, hailing from all walks. We've interviewed chefs, writers, costumers, musicians, yoga teachers, comedians, burlesque dancers, folks in the film and TV industry, and more. We'd be delighted for you to join us every other Monday on the Certain POV Podcast Network. Or wherever you get your podcasts, fresh and tasty off the presses. What? what? That's... No, that's not... Can I call them screen beans now? Fine. Screen beans! So tune in and we'll see you at the movies or on a couch somewhere. Because you're a whole screen beans now. You will be mine. Aurora. CPOV. CertainPOV.com.